Hey everybody. Uh, hey, uh, who's that? Bruce. Cool. So um, next, do I have to do anything special to get this clicker to behave? This is 30 minutes of my talk. Is asking for help about the clicker. Is this? He's seriously using Chrome for my talk. That's cool. So, that's why it didn't work. Um, all right. Just kidding. So, it, okay, here we go. So, so. Uh, let me just introduce myself. I'm Mike Taylor. I'm the lead graphic designer for Mozilla. And um, I have an air conditioner, which is useful. So, clicker, okay. I just want to be really clear, like, it, during my talk today, like, I'm not part of Mozilla DevRel, like, I don't officially speak for DevRel. I'm, like, more of a Rudy Giuliani shadow foreign policy situation where I'm, I'm going to say some things, um, and if they're true, that's great, and if they're not true, like, they're my opinion, but, um, so, so just a little bit about me, I, I work for Mozilla, I've uh, worked a little bit with standards um, in web compatibility, um, I help with a website called webcompat.com, which we'll talk about later, maybe, where you can go and, like, report broken websites, um, but, delay and click. So, so Bruce Lawson, nine years ago, was this about? We wrote, we wrote a talk together called Introducing WebSockets. It has nothing to do with my talk today. Um, I'm not sure why I shared that. <laughs> Should I be pointing the clicker in any direction? That way? Down. Hey, cool. Okay, so, so let's restart the timer. Um, all right, so, so let's try to actually get into the talk, right? What we're going to talk about today is I'm going to talk a, a really quick little introductory history into browser engines, and uh, we're going to talk about a more recent history, uh, and then I'm going to tell you why, or I will convince you why I'm right about how diversity is, is good. Um, and so to set the stage here, like 1993, raise your hands if you were alive. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, so, like, the really what grounded me when I was preparing this, 1993 was the year that um, Tim Berners-Lee open sourced the World Wide Web or Nexus web browser source. It had been in development. This was kind of like the first web browser. It had been in development for a few years, but this was when it was unleashed. Um, 1993, Ace of Base, I saw the sign. Like, that's what grounded me. Help me connect with the web. Um, it's a really good song. Um, 1993 is also when Mosaic became a thing. This was a, a research project that eventually turned into a commercial thing. Um, so that's the Mosaic logo. That's, that browser engine was licensed by Microsoft. It turned into the first version of IE. The Mosaic people went and started their own company and rewrote Mosaic effectively and turned it into Netscape. Um, we can, actually I'm going to need some help, I won't be able to click this. Can, can the slide <coughs> operator individual click on that little sparkle flame button, the top left of the screen please? We're going to watch some navigate very slowly. <laughs> there you go, almost got it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna look at the growth of early browser engines. Does it click? Here we go. Who got excited then? <laughs> right. So so Netscape existed. It was massive. Mosaic got tiny. IE got big. So this was kind of like the very first kind of like browser war situation where 
Um, we'll, we'll talk about that later, what that means. But okay, so does anyone recognize this thing on the left? Raise your hand. This is Comforter, right? This was kind of the very first open source web kit ish thing. Um, it turned into Safari, um, kind of. So, so here's a little just history lesson for you um, in this aside. So KHTML, which is, if you've ever looked at the user agent string of, of a Chrome browser or an IE browser or of a lot of other browsers, it'll say KHTML, comma, like Gecko. Um, and where that comes from, KHTML comes from the KHTML W library, which was the KDE HTML widget, which comes from cool desktop environment HTML, right? So KHTML, you have to pronounce it cool HTML. Um, <laughs> raise your hand if you already knew that. That's weird. <laughs> Hardcore Linux nerds. There's a few over there, none over there. Um, okay, so. Okay. Another, another interesting fact, which is also slightly weird, is this is a, a photo view of 98 Vald, what's it, Valdemar Franzgata, which is a building in Oslo, Norway. Um, on the fourth floor, there were two companies. One was Trolltech, which made Qt and KDE and Conqueror. Also on the fourth floor was Opera Software, and so they developed their own rendering engine known as Presto. So you had coming off like the same, the, the same building floor, two influential web browser engines. Um, it's kind of mysterious. I think they shared a lunchroom. Um, it's like if you take the door on the left, you go open source. If you take the door on the right, like you don't. Um, so the Netscape folks, they eventually started working on this open source browser called Phoenix uh, before they found out that it was like there was a trademark or a copyright, and so they renamed that thing into Firefox, and this is how we got Gecko. So this is um, not the Wizard of Oz. No, this is the Wizard of Oz. Um, I'm setting the stage here, right? So th these are kind of like, in the early days, before like two years ago, there were five rendering engines that were really important. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna look and see if, if I can get my operator friend up there to click on that. Fun button. We're going to see how these five browser rendering engines behaved at this point. Can I can I get a click slide, friend? <laughs> They're thinking about it. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So you can start to see Firefox is a thing. It's growing, Safari starts to become a thing, Opera's a thing, Chrome happens, 2009. It really takes off, right? Like 2011 was, was a huge year for Chrome. Um, and I, I was curious what happened here. Um, I think I need focus on the web page and not on the HTML button, if that's possible. I should have really used my computer here. There we go. So, so 2011, big year. Um, does anyone remember watching the season finale of Saturday Night Live in 2011? There was a Google Chrome Lady Gaga commercial, which was, she was also the, um, the musical performer. So that was really interesting. But also that same year, there was a really influential Justin Bieber Google Chrome commercial um, and so I'm convinced that Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber are, like, responsible for Chrome's success, um, which is important later on. Okay, so now that we've got out of the way, like, some bad stuff happens after this point in history. Um, it gets a little dark. Let's... Uh, Sorry to make you do this one last time. Can we, can we click play again? And then we're done. So Chrome is really taking off, really, really growing at everyone else's expense. Um, and then we, so effectively, that's where we are up until pretty recently. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna try to click, if I can get focused on the slide again, let's see if this works. 
Yes. Okay. okay. So, so this guy, Bruce Lawson, he had the, the, the privilege, the, I'll pose, I'll wait for a photo. Um, he was the guy who got to write the following article, right? Um, 300 million users have moved to WebKit. So what happened, so I used to work at Opera, full disclosure. We, for site compatibility reasons, we, we found it was not sustainable to keep maintaining Presto. Too many websites did not test in Opera. Um, raise your hand if you ever tested in Opera. Pretty unique set of individuals here. Right? Um, where I live in the United States, most people said, Opera, what's that? Right? Um, and it, it was big in different locales and different markets, but, but eventually site compatibility became too much of a burden. We couldn't justify it, and so we, we made the switch to WebKit, and I think it was like a week or two later that, that Google decided to fork from WebKit, so then we didn't go back and update the blog post, but we switched to Blink, right? Like, I don't think we actually ever did anything with WebKit. Um, so just to read that quote, consumers will initially notice better site compatibility, especially with mobile-facing sites, many of which have been only been tested in WebKit browsers. A couple of years later, like a very similar article was written by some Microsoft guy that I don't know, but he's got cool hair. Um, like Microsoft people will like that joke. So, Mr. VP Joe, he writing for the same reason, like we can't keep up Edge HTML, like it's too costly, it's too expensive, we're not, we're not like, and he says, we're announcing we intend to adopt Chromium uh, to create better web compatibility for our customers and less fragmentation of the web for all developers, which uh, again, that's, that's two engines that were toast at this point, right? Uh, interestingly, two closed source browsers were, uh, unable to keep up. I don't know if that's like a lesson, but it's just a fact. Um, and I'll let everyone read this and then contemplate if it's a good joke or not. Uh, it turns out we're using Chrome in this browser, so this doesn't make any sense. And so we're already starting to see some of the effects of that, right? Like of other people moving to Chromium or Blink, and it's like, oh, we, we really don't have to test in other browsers now, which is which is weird. So here's, here's the modern scene, right, where we've got three of the, of the main rendering engines left. WebKit and Blink are different enough now that, that I would consider them separate, right? They're related, but uh, they implement different APIs, um, different levels of support for, for certain things. Um, and then there's lots of little Chromium friends, Chromium-based browsers. Uh, so often the question you get when you start thinking about this, is like, why don't we all just use Blink? Um, or why don't we all just use Gecko, right? Like, monoculture is only bad if it's not my culture, is my conclusion. That's not true. So, realistically though, like, raise your hand if it's ever, like, been a pain in the butt for you to fix a bug in a different browser, where you're just like, I got all my stuff working, and then I opened it in, whatever browser, and then you're like, crap, I have to rewrite this, or I have to implement some hacks. Like, it really slows you down, and, and it feels frustrating, right? Um, like, like, raise your hand if you've ever thought as you're like, going through this pain, you're like, you know what, this is good for me. Like, this is good for the long-term web. <laughs> so these are the special people, and I wanna hire all three of you. Um, <laughs> like, what, what I'm gonna hopefully argue in the next three minutes, or however long I have, um, is this is a good thing. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to talk about a couple of examples. Uh, so, so this one is, is interesting. I don't know if you read mailing lists or follow working groups, uh, but if you do, you might know a little bit about intrinsic size. This was a, a WYCG, or YCG, or however that's pronounced, um, proposal by some Chrome engineers to add an attribute to HTML to allow you to get image orientation or like, uh, not orientation, but aspect ratio right. You know, like as things become responsive and if, if you have an image and it's like width 100%, you change the viewport, like things can get wonky. Um, and so they said, we're gonna add this attribute. Um, and the way this would work, just look at the top line, is you would have this and you would say like, this is the intrinsic size. Um, so this, had an implementation, it was a uh, experimental 
Chromium platform feature, you could have enabled it in your, in your browser and, and tested it and, and given them feedback. Um, it turns out, oh shucks, I didn't take a screenshot of this, but Jen Simmons and some other folks, they, they said, you know what, I, I don't think we need to add a new attribute to HTML, we can just do this like with tools that already exist, and this, these three lines of code, um, three through five, like if we just invent this aspect ratio property and stick it in user agent style sheets, um, which are CSS that the web page uses to render everything by default, um, we can get this for free. And so this was a pretty cool proposal, like counter proposal was implemented in Gecko, and uh, we've been experimenting with it. Just recently, Blink sent out an intent to implement, and so they're like, yeah, this is actually a better idea. Um, and so this is an instance where when you have competition, or you have people who are competing in a friendly manner to get like to a good place, you, you can kind of push and pull. Um, and you can say, this, we have this idea, and other people say, well, what about this? And ultimately, the web is a better place. Like, it's probably slowed us down, I don't know, six months or something. I don't have the dates, right? And you still can't use this today, um, or rather, you don't need to use this today, but when it's, when it's implemented in all the evergreen browsers, it'll still be a little bit of time, but it'll be a better API, and it's like one less attribute you have to know about, and you never have to touch your markup. Um, another, another area which is interesting is, so this is not really like in the API space, but it's privacy. Um, right now, if, if you've been following this, there will be talks about this tomorrow by Selena, um, and others probably. But like privacy is kind of like this really hot area uh, for web browsers right now. So we've been, in Firefox, been doing lots of stuff with um, what we call enhanced tracking protection. Uh, we, just, we just announced recently that we're going to block third-party tracking cookies and crypto, crypto trackers, cryptocurrency miners, whatever they're called, by default. Um, and you can, you can track fingerprinters if you want to enable that. Um, Chromium has some interesting kind of proposals and counter proposals for this. There's a, sort of a collection of APIs called Privacy Sandbox. Sandbox excuse me. Um, it's APIs and kind of just like general privacy framework way to think about these things. Um, that's slightly different. Safari also announced their intelligent tracking prevention. They've been blogging about this, which is uh, inspired by the Firefox stuff, and they put a slightly different spin on it. But you can see how as as an end user, like we benefit from this type of competition, right? And we also have more choice. Um, privacy is this area where it's kind of at the, there's, there is a Venn diagram of like web standards, but then there's also just like product specific stuff. Um, so we may ultimately all end up, you know, designing APIs that honor the principles core to, to privacy and security. Um, but we may, you know, you may be able to just pick and choose browsers that have different opinions and different attitudes. Um, here's, here's another area where um, I, I believe diversity is, is interesting and useful. So this is an icon which represents a thing called Gecko View. Um, Gecko View, I think it got a, a mention earlier today uh, by Andreas Bovens. What, so if, if you've ever developed something using WebView, has anyone used WebView here? A couple people? You might be like building Android apps or building your own browsers or whatever. The, the kind of crappy thing about WebView is it's tied to the version of Android that your users are on. And so there are multiple versions of Android, like a million or so. And you can't, you can't reliably depend on certain APIs, they just don't exist in WebView. And so what we've done, kind of one of the core principles of, of Gecko View is you have like a stable rendering engine that has support for all the web standards that, that Firefox supports. There's not WebView Chrome parity 100%. Um, and it's portable, it's predictable, and you can go and like build things with it. Um, and so this is kind of like innovation in the web embedding space, and, and maybe that will inspire Chrome to come back and say like, we've got, or Google, sorry, you know, we've got these other ideas, and like that benefits users. Um, you, can, you can go ahead and use Gecko, build, Gecko View to build a browser today. We, we have one called Firefox Preview, we've got Firefox Reality, there's another browser called Puma, they're using the Gecko, Gecko View code base, they're um, 
hooked up with the COIL web payment stuff, that $100 million that Dees is carrying around today. Um, so those, those are three examples. You, you kind of have like APIs, platformy stuff, policy, featurey stuff. Just some examples of why diversity is important, I think. And, and I think it's also useful for us to consider like what, like if we, if we just get super cynical and look at who is creating, like who's building the browser engines and like what is driving their vision for the web. Um, and I don't want to get like super dark or grouchy. Um, and so like we're going to be positive about this. Um, so this is, this is like shadow dev realm moment, right? This is the Mike Taylor view on the world. Like, what, what does Apple do? Like, what, what drives them? They sell hardware, they have some services, um, and, like, that's where most of their money comes from, right? And so they're, what motivates them, like, is, is an interesting question. Um, if, if you were at TPAC in Japan, or just, like, you like to read IRC logs or whatever, like, Apple had a, a couple of interesting CSS proposals in the CSS working group related to, like, the new iPad desktop mode. They're trying to solve really like interesting challenges for getting a desktop browser in kind of like a mobile-ish form factor, like with text inflation, font inflation, or whatever, text size adjust, I forget the details. Um, so they're trying to solve certain problems that that like Google is not trying to solve, right? Google doesn't sell iPads. But Google, so at its core, Google's an advertising company, um, which I think is interesting to consider. Like they have some hardware stuff. Uh, but they also have tons of services, right? Like all, all the really cool apps, web apps that I use every day are run by Google, right? Like Google Docs, um, Google Wave, that one I use a lot. Uh, Orkut, Blogger, right? Uh, yeah, really good stuff. Google Reader! Yes, Google Reader, Google Inbox, all right? Sorry. So, <laughs> but like, 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 really interesting, like high performance web apps, like, like the Gmail code base, or just like Gmail web app is amazing. Google Docs amazing. Like, really, really pushes like their needs. And, and this is my opinion, of course. I don't work for them. Mozilla. What, what do we do at Mozilla? Like, like, the, like the cynical view is like we're a bunch of like ivory tower nerds, just like trying to make the internet the best place possible. Um, that's maybe not a negative thing. I don't know. Someone else could have a better negative answer. We'll let Google respond, um, right? So like, we're not we're not trying to sell ads. We're not trying to sell. I think we tried to sell hardware once. It didn't really work out. Um, and then Google went and bought the company, and it's like actually works now. So that's cool. So. Um, like we're we're all motivated motivated by different things, and I think that's actually like really positive. Um, like just because Mozilla has a proposal for a thing, or just because Apple has a proposal for a thing, does not mean it's going to be baked into the web platform. Um, at least it hasn't historically, right? Like there's been this kind of common understanding of like at, at the W3C level, before something becomes like a standard, you need at least two independent implementations of a standard, right? Um, and so. And, and hopefully more than just two. Like if this is a model that continues, like we really need to rely on each other and you kind of like need to collaborate and develop things in a way that's sane for implementations, right? Like is it even possible to build this thing in Blink or in WebKit or in Gecko? We need to think about things that are good for our users. Um, all of us are concerned about privacy and security these days. Like these, these are like, these are, um, I don't want to get emotional, but these are like scary and weird times to be alive. Um, just take a pause, right? Tear drop. Um, you know, like, the, like there are people who, depending on which countries they're in and which websites they're visiting, they might go to jail, right? Like that's wild and that might be worse than jail. And so like we have to keep people safe. Um, and so we can't just do everything that one person wants to do because it fits their interests. Um, the other point to this slide is, is really like with the intrinsic size thing, it was like it worked and it was a cool proposal, but that was version one. Like if you've ever written anything or any code or any paper, like you know that version one is always like, it works. 
but like it can always be better. Um, and so this kind of like diverse browser engine world uh, enables that. And like we steal things from each other all the time, and I think that's really positive. Um, let's see. So I told you you would all be convinced, and you're really like connecting with this slide right now. So so what can you do? Um, if like I don't know what the future looks like, right? Like Google is large and they have a lot of market share. Um, they also like do really interesting things. Like I've never met anyone who works on the Google Chrome team. That's a monster. Um, that's reassuring to me. But I think I think we also need more than that, right? Like we need we don't just need Google to not be monsters. Like we need other browsers to be able to grow and flourish and like have a chance at, at working. So. Um, some, of the, some concrete steps you can do as, as an individual as a developer. Has, has anyone ever seen this page? Uh, yeah, you probably have, right? Like this is, I think, document.compat mode browser table, which lets you know if you're in quirks mode or not. I use that a lot. Um, so, so these are the Indian browser compat tables that let you know, like, is this API well supported? Like, as you're, as you're shipping production ready code, like, it's probably good to check this stuff out. Like what will happen if you know n percent of my users can't use this feature? Um, something to consider. Like, and we should still open up our apps and our websites and other browsers and test them. And uh, can people still do this? Like sometimes, yeah. That's good. More of that, please. Um, there we go. Has anyone here ever like reported a browser bug? Okay, that's really cool. That's like maybe 10 people, 15 people. Um, has anyone here ever, was ever like afraid? They thought they found a browser bug, but you were like, it's probably my fault, I'm not that smart. That's like at least as many people, maybe more. Um, does anyone here work for a browser company? like three times as many. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of hand raising, sorry. Like, raise your hand if as a browser engineer someone filed a bug and they were wrong and you felt angry. <laughs> Two. Okay, you're bad people. Uh, you work for me. <laughs> we'll have a chat later, but... Uh, File bugs, right? Like you can file them to Bugzilla, to WebKit, to CRBug, um, or you can just go to webcompat.com and file a bug, and if it is like a real interop issue, like my team will just like do that for you. Um, so, yeah, so my final plea, I was, I didn't have the time to do the Photoshop work, but I was, like the, uh, the other strategy, like if that does not work, if we raise enough money to get Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber to do a Firefox commercial. <laughs> like 2020, we could really turn this thing around. So, um, where's Bees? He's got all the money. Like we could get him for a hundred million dollars. I'm, I'm confident. Uh, I really just want this clicker to work. Okay, so, so that's my talk. Um, I have a web blog. You can join my web ring. Just send a pull request. So. Thank you very much.